Hello everyone, my name is Michael Jacobs and I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Jacobs 3D Biomechanics Lab and an introduction to a little series on is speed training for you and if so how do you know how you should do it? And, and it's a great question and if we looked at great athletes like for example if we went back to the Olympics and we looked at Usain Bolt running a sprint we could look at his technique and we could try to analyze what he does, but does that necessarily mean that you should run or we would expect you to run as he does? So there's a lot to go that goes into assessing yourself, assessing how you swing the club, so you can make the best decision. One thing that we do every day in the lab is we take a full assessment of the true capabilities of the person. Here you're seeing somebody get a full body scan with us. And here I'm explaining and demonstrating to them the difference between, let's say, a perfect type of classroom type skeleton to what their skeleton would be. And you could see that the red muscles and the blue muscles are showing the different types of imbalances that are within this person. Here this person had, a, had quite a spinal twist and uh, also uh, a deep hip rotation. So we could not expect this person to have speed training with the same level of, let's say, uh, a high-end tour player. I think the last thing that you want to do is move poorly and then try to move poorly faster. So that's what I'm going to try to help you navigate through this little series that we're making uh, for, for everyone to learn a little something. And as we go through this three parts, we're going we're gonna to do it in uh, three different sections. We're going to do it from toes to nose, I always say. And we're going to cover the feet today. And then we'll work our way up through the body and then out to the club. Ultimately, whatever we do, it's what's transferred to the club that ultimately uh, increases your club head speed. Um, I've been known to teach some uh, major champions and they've increased their club head speed and they've been able to stabilize their club head speed but a lot of times you'd be surprised on the method that was used to achieve that. I'd like to share a little bit with you today on what we look for from the feet and you might never have thought of that before about your golf swing. Well I got some props here and one of the things that we've done it's now 13 or 14 years of the creation of our biomechanics company and studying human movement. And I have to say, it's been a real interesting journey. I've learned a lot uh, from my anatomy study to working with Dr. Nesbitt to all the stuff that you see when you come for a lesson or in our books and papers. But a lot of times we don't get to publish everything right away because there's a lot. For example, Dr. Nesbitt is in the process of finishing up work and power analysis of the golf swing 2. Uh, his famous paper in 2005, work and power analysis of the swing, is one of the most cited papers in the history of sports science when it comes to, to uh, striking sports like golf and baseball. And what we've done is we've written the sequel to that, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. But some things like some of the research we've done on the human foot, how you walk, how you stand, and how, you relate to, how it relates to your swing is going to take a lot of time to get to. So let's touch on it a little bit here and assess if you should work your feet differently in your first step to assessing um, how, if you should do some speed training. So the first place I'm going to have you start your assessment is to look at the shape of your foot when you stand and when you walk and it'll give you an idea on whether or not you should feel like you lift your heel during a swing. So one of the oldest things that's been talked about and debated about is when a golfer makes a backswing, should they lift their front heel? In my case, I'm a righty golfer. Should I lift my front heel on the swing? And if you go back to the old days before video and pictures, I think most players did that. And now as time's gone on and we've analyzed swings and we looked at videos, I think a lot of that has been moved away from golf. And a lot of people are focused more on, you know, looking more stable and things like that. But what we found is there's a direct correlation to your standing posture 
and how you walk and whether or not you should lift your front heel on the backswing. So if you're looking behind me and I'll put some extra images uh, as we edit this little video, you're looking at two distinct standing postures. The one on this side shows that when the person is in their standing posture and we have a, um, in my lab, we have a standing posture um, analysis. We have a gait walking analysis. We have a bunch of movement analysis that gives us an idea of, number one, what your posture are, what you're like pretty static, and then what you are dynamically. And we're looking for what type of movement potential we could expect when I'm helping you with your golf swing. But these two are distinct differences. So when you look at the one here, where you see a good portion of the whole footprint on the ground, that happens to be my standing posture there. When I'm standing on the ground, you can see that there's the front part of my foot, the heel, and the midfoot. When we say midfoot, we're talking more of this portion of the foot here, which is between the ball of the foot and the heel. So this would be the midfoot. I'm just going to get rid of this one here and we'll just use the bones. And I'm going to explain to you a little more about how the foot works, but you can see when I put my feet on the ground, I have a midfoot in my standing posture on the ground. That would be what would be considered a so-called normal foot in posture analysis. Now a very common one where there is no midfoot on the ground. This would be considered more of a high arch where the foot is actually a bent foot, <laughs> so to speak, but we'll save that conversation for another day. But what's happening is in the standing posture, the only two things that are putting pressure into the ground are the heel and the ball of the foot, and there is no midfoot. Now, when there is no midfoot in someone's standing posture, when they go to swing the club, there is a lot of front to back, I don't want to say instability, but a lot more front to back challenges than somebody who has a midfoot. Now in often times, and you'll see some walking patterns go across the screen here, and what you're looking at is you're looking at how the person moves through their gait pattern when they walk. And a lot of times when there is no midfoot, and they walk, the heel will strike, and then there'll be no midfoot hitting the ground, and then it'll go right to the forefoot. And in more of a healthier, normal gait, we would want to see midfoot strike in the ground. Now, why is that? Well, in a healthy standing posture, what a lot of people don't realize is, here's the heel bone, here's the talus bone, uh, it's a fancy word for <laughs> anatomical part. So the weight of the leg goes straight down this talus bone here. So when I'm when you're getting ready to walk, you're you're in a great in a advantageous situation. It would be heel strike, and then the weight of the leg would be a little offset from that. So the bones of the foot would yield into the ground like that. That would allow your midfoot to show up in a gait pattern. And then once your back leg or your swing leg comes through, the foot would then lock and push off. Now, if you're someone who is in this position here with no midfoot, your foot is locked the whole time. It's locked to push off the whole time. And in those golf swings, those people will have a lot of front to back changes in their swing. And we would expect a totally different swing pattern for them than we would for someone with a midfoot. Now, how do we navigate through this? I think the two most important things to do is understand how you should manipulate the twist of your hips in conjunction with the heels and the toes to make a sound motion in your swing. So let me show you a couple of ways that you could assess yours and then how you could apply it to your swing. The quickest way is to assess yourself without having all this fancy equipment is just when you hop out of the shower, walk across the wood floor in the house and leave some footprints. Or when you go to the beach, walk in the wet sand and leave some footprints. When you stand 
and when you walk and try to look to see how much of a midfoot that you have. If you're someone without a midfoot and you stick your shoes then in some leather coffins, as we say, waterproof golf shoes, you're going to have a lot of front to back, heel to toe, lack of midfoot movement in your swing. So you're going to have to do a much better job controlling the forward backward motion in your swing. So on the takeaway, when you take the club back, it is recommended that when you push your front hip forward and the back hip back, that you allow your front heel to come off the ground more. By doing this, it allows you to take advantage of the fact that you don't have a midfoot. Because if you don't do that, you try to keep your foot on the ground without a midfoot, you're going to take it back and you're going to really limit your ability to move that front hip forward so you can move it back when you come into the strike. And that's a real big power or speed loss. Now when it comes to the back foot on the backswing, when someone does not have a midfoot touching the ground, there are a lot of challenges in the transition. So if you're somebody who has a lot of force in the club that brings it in this direction on, in the transition, you need to really pay attention to whether or not you're able to, to push off the heel into the midfoot, into the toes, or are you someone who goes right from heel to toe without a midfoot push off like you would have in gait, walking, or running. So when you're making your backswing and you're pushing your right hip back, someone without a midfoot really needs to feel like that when they push their hip back, they feel the majority of their force towards the heel of that right foot or the trail foot, whichever, if you're righty or lefty. And then when they go to propel themselves forward, it needs to feel like a, a very detailed heel to toe push that allows the hip to propel towards the ball when we rotate. Somebody without midfoot generally has a tough time pushing back and down to get that hip to move towards the ball. And what they will do is they'll go right from their heel to their toe. And then when you go right from heel to toe early, the way that we get pushed in our connection with the ground actually stops your back hip from moving. And then you have to do more upper body type stuff when you swing. Now, if you're someone who has a midfoot, what you want to do is you want to feel that heel to toe gradual motion when you're moving your hips over your feet and twisting your body and you want to feel almost like um, uh, let's say somebody was going to open a, a can of coke and it was a little coke bottle and you're going to twist the coke you want to feel like when you're twisting your body and you're pushing your left hip forward and your right hip back on the backswing and then eventually at some point you're going to reverse it the other way you want to feel that move through um, not only the toes, the heels, but the whole entire midfoot. And you want to put that sensation to what we're going to do through the rest of the body and out to the club. So in our next video, we're going to talk more about how we go from our foot analysis up through the body and then out to the club. And you'll find out then that when you go to add speed to your swing, you'll do it the right way and not just some haphazard buy something, swing it, and pray for speed. So get to assessing your feet, and I think you'll have a different balance idea in your head. Michael Jacobs, see you in video two.